Welcome everyone and thanks for joining. Um, I'm Marie Lavette Caduto. I'm what's called a watershed planner for this region. <laughs> Excuse me. And so this is kind of the kickoff meeting for what we call Basin 10, which is the Ottaquichi and the Black Rivers. And I know a number of you know this, some of this already, but I'm gonna go ahead and go through just the presentation that I have to give an overview of what the basin planning process is um, and basically how this all works and what um, I would love to hear from you on, on you know, how your thoughts on what needs to get done around here. So um, Chris from Montescutney Regional Commission is gonna be monitoring the chat. If you wanna put something in the chat, or if you have something during one of the slides that you have a question um, about, you can either raise your hand or pop it into the chat and, and Chris will um, bring it to my attention. And I'm gonna also point out Kelly Stetner, who's on here, the, the Kelly Black River Action Team. Kelly's taking notes for us tonight. So she, if, if something gets said and she needs to ask a question for clarity or to, to catch something that she missed, um, she'll, she'll be jumping in as well if she needs to, just so you know what's going on. All right. I may, I may throw, if, if, if I didn't hear something, I may throw something in the chat to ask for clarification so that I don't, um, that I, I don't interrupt whoever's actually speaking or presenting. And, Hi, Gwen, I should have recognized you. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> good, good. All right. All right thanks, thanks for letting me. Uh-oh. So if you want to just let me know that you can see what I'm, see everything, uh, it would be great. Is it coming through? Yep, yes. No problem. Great. All right. I can only see so much here, so. Um, let me know. Well, that didn't work either. There we go. So as I said, this is this is the kickoff meeting for the tactical basin plan for the Ottaquichi and the Black Rivers. And we also cover part of the Connecticut. I'll shoot you a map in just a sec. Um, if you if you know the Connecticut River around this region, um, that's Mount Escutney from, from across the river on the New Hampshire side, which is always fun. All right, please work. There looking we. south, looking south. Yes. So we do these basin plans all over the state. Uh, this isn't anything new. We've been doing it for, for a long time. I think this is my third round for the Black and Ottaquichi rivers. And so what we're doing, we're covering this region, the tan and the blue on this map, which is the Ottaquichi, the black and the tributaries that flow directly into the Connecticut River. And so what that means, I can get my little pointer here. So the Ottaquichi River is the, the Northern one, basically from Killington Peak down through um, coming through Bridgewater, Woodstock, Hartford, and, and ending up down in Heartland at the dam down that way. The Black River starting up on the other, on the, in the Greens as well in Shrewsbury and coming down through Plymouth, Ludlow, Cavendish, Weathersfield and ending up at Hoyt's Landing in Springfield. Um, and then there's these smaller brooks, Lulls Brook, which is kind of in the Heartland area, Mill Brook, Wedding, Wedding, Reading, West Windsor, and Windsor. And then the other Mill Brook that runs on the south side of Mount Escutney. Um, and then some of the smaller tributaries all the way down to Commissary Brook, which is um, just north of Herrick's Cove and the mouth of the Williams River. So that's the area that this is covering. And I do cover about 38 miles of the Connecticut River main stem itself. What we try to do in these basin plans is to answer a bunch of questions. We're looking at what the current water quality is and what the current habitat conditions are in our, in our rivers, streams, lakes, and ponds as well. 
what are the things that we should be doing to improve those, the water quality as well as the, the habitat conditions that we have? How do we do that? What are the strategies we could implement to make those improvements happen? And that's where I want, absolutely want input from, from you folks who know the rivers better than I do. Um, who to work with? Who are the potential partners? A lot of folks on this call are partners um, with organizations and other agencies that we work with a lot, but we're always looking to implement projects with, with partners that we haven't connected with yet. And what do we want to do with our rivers? We call these management goals. You know, what needs to be protected? How do we use them? How do we want to make sure we can use them going forward? Um, we want to make sure that they're all swimmable and fishable. And you know, what are the other uses that we make of our waters? We do this in a five-year planning cycle. So it takes us a while. Um, this one started actually a couple of years ago where we started um, with, with our crews going out and doing the water quality monitoring. And then a team of, of assessment folks stepped in and they take all that data and tell us what it means. They put it all together and, and summarize what that data is telling us. And then we planners step in and we start this process, which is this, this kickoff. Um, to look at what we need to do to develop the plan, um, what needs to be in it, what your, you know, your input is so that we can make this a plan that's going to be useful to everyone. And then we spend three or four years implementing that plan, making those projects happen. And then as we come back around to the five years, we go, we look back and say, how did we do? Did we get those in place? Um, what do we need to do? What do we need to carry forward into the next planning cycle? So we've done the monitoring, we've done the assessment, <clears throat> and now you know I'm, I'm in the plan development stage. So that's where we are with all of this. And you know when we when we talk about doing the monitoring, we do monitoring on all our waters, rivers, lakes, streams, ponds, and wetlands. Um, and we do three kinds of monitoring. We do physical, which we call stream geomorphic assessments, looking at what's actually happening with the physical environment. We do the chemical monitoring for nutrients, pH, all those parameters. And we also do biological monitoring, looking at the bugs and the fish and the communities that live in the aquatic system. And that piece of it, the bug piece in particular, is what we base a lot of our information on and, and how we evaluate our waters. Because the bugs in the water tell us a lot. They live there for anywhere from a few months to five years. So they experience everything that the waters go through. And we learn a lot from them. This is how we display that information. So when you see all the scales that I'm gonna show you on the maps, Everything on the green end of the scale is good, green or blue on some of them, and anything on the yellow, orange, red scale is not so good. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. <clears throat> as I said, the monitoring was done a couple of years ago so that the assessments could be done. Um, and that monitoring kind of identifies where the problems are, what the sources of pollution might be and the causes of that pollution getting into the water. Um, it also identifies the good stuff, the high quality waters that we want to protect and, and keep in good shape. And what we call impaired waters, the ones that are not meeting our water quality standards. So I just focused in here, we're focusing a little more on the Black River today. Um, so as I said, all the green stuff is in good shape. And you can see the green stuff is pretty well distributed. Um, you know, the, the areas where there's more of the other colors you would expect because, you know, that's the, the Ludlow area, a lot of development around Okemo. Um, so you expect th those to have impacts and a little bit, you know, through Springfield. Um, but that's, other than that, the, the basin, or the, the watershed is in pretty good shape. Same with the, the Mill Brooks and Lowell Brook and stuff. They're in good shape as well. If you're really interested, you can find all this data on the 
Agency of Natural Resources, Natural Resources Atlas. And if you just Google Vermont Natural Resources Atlas, you'll get to it. And if you click on all the right layers, you come up with this, this little symbol here. And that's telling you that we have a monitoring site in that location. And if you click on the symbol, you get this. And that tells you if they're, each one of these tells you we're looking at something. So it tells you we're looking at the bugs, we're looking at the fish, the chemistry and the habitat. Sometimes you have all four, sometimes you only have one. Some sites are just chemical sites. Some streams are too small for us to monitor for fish. So, you know, it, it varies depending on the site, um, but it's all the same as far as the green color goes. The green colors, the, co the chart doesn't look at colors of chemistry and, and the habitat. That's just for the fish and the bugs. We also monitor our lakes, and this is the blue to red scale instead of the green to red scale. Um, and this one looks at four different aspects of lakes. It looks at the water quality trend, which is more the, the chemical end of it, the nutrients in the lakes, um, the shoreland habitat, what's the condition of the shoreland? Is it all developed? Is it a parking lot? Is it woods? Um, that's what we're looking at for that. Then we look at whether or not that lake is impacted by any invasive species like milfoil or water chestnut. And pretty much all of them are yellow for atmospheric mercury deposition. That's just where we live in the world. Um, we get that those impacts from Midwestern industrial plants and they dump on us in this part of Vermont. So we have mostly yellow in that end of things. When we look at the good stuff, you know, our, our waters are in mostly really good condition. And we look at that and we classify our rivers by the condition that they're in. We have three classes, basically, A1, B1, and B2. We also have this A1, A2 section, which I'm not really going to talk about. That's for very specifically for like reservoirs that are drinking water supply. And obviously, we have to manage those very differently than we manage our natural waters. So I'm not going to get into A2s. Those are, are set and they're in our water quality standards. But the way we manage our, our natural waters, rivers, lakes, streams, um, we do it by this class. And our A1 waters are the most natural condition and in the best shape. Um, so, and we have very clear criteria on what meets an A1 standard. We have the same for B1 and B2. All of these, even B2, are good water quality. They're fishable, they're drinkable, they're swimmable. You know, it's, it's not like we have bad waters um, until we meet, we go drop down below the B2, and I'll talk about that in a minute. When we do this classification, we do it by the use we make of that water. And there are seven EPA, what's called designated uses. And that's, that's what these are, aquatic biota and habitat, aesthetics, is it pleasing to look at? Does it smell bad? Um, boating, fishing, water supply, and swimming. So we, we go by these and we look at what condition they're in. And you can see from this that, that most natural conditions, really good conditions and good conditions. <clears throat> We have just gotten the B1 classification recently. So we're in the process of trying of determining what waters we need to make B1s. Right now we just have A1 and B2. And the reason we put B1 in there is to keep our waters that are in good condition in good condition. Because what, what this means is that if we have an A1 water, we we can't let that the quality of that water degrade beyond the B1 criteria. So it can go down with a, so, you know, permits come in and discharges go into the water, but it can't be degraded below the B1 or as the state, we have to work to bring that back. 
So we wanted that cutoff point in the middle. We didn't want it to be able to be degraded all the way down to the low end of B2, because once it passes that, it becomes an impaired water. And you hear lots about impaired waters in Lake Champlain and toxic algae and all those fun things. We really don't want our waters to end up in that place. Um, so we make these cutoffs where we have to respond and do something to improve water quality if it's been degraded. And this is what our classes look like right now. As I said, we're just getting B underway. So the purple are the A1 waters. By statute, everything that's above 2,500 feet in elevation is automatically an A1. <clears throat> Excuse me. The green is the, the public water supplies. And then that, that little spot where there's tan um, is both because the town has reclassified that as from an A2 to an A1. And so it's got a mixed set of uses. These three waters, North Branch of the Ottaquichi, Tributary, Great Brook, and a, and a Tributary of Chester Brook, we know are already meeting the criteria for A1 for aquatic habitat. So through this basin plan, we'll be putting forward, um, or I'll be working with the partners to put forward petitions to make these changes. And as we, I hear from you, we may in, add other waters to that list as well. Another way we have for protecting waters is what's called outstanding resource water. And this is a designation that we have that we can do for all 14, one or more of these characteristics. It can be for water quality. It can be for great fish habitat. It can be because it's aesthetically pleasing with gorges and waterfalls. So there's a lot of different ways to protect our waters. And this one, um, can be done on any of these. And again, it's a petition process. So we look to, to you folks, um, to our partners and the public to, to put these forward to the agency to make these classifications happen. We also look at our wetlands and we have three classes of wetlands, one, two, and three. Most things are two. Little small ones are threes that, that are not actually regulated. Uh, but these are potential class one wetlands. So if we find wetlands that we think might meet the criteria, then, then we list them in the basin plan and we look to our wetlands program to go out and assess those wetlands to see if they meet those criteria. And if you know Esquibog at all in Heartland, um, that's a pretty amazing, it's a little, very small wetland, but it is quite an amazing place. And this is in the process of, it's already been petitioned by the Heartland Conservation Commission to become a class one wetland. So that's go, gotta go through the whole legislative process, but that one is already in pro process, which is great. And then we have the other end of the red end of the spectrum. Unfortunately, we do have these. Um, and when we say a water is impaired, it means it's not meeting our Vermont water quality standards. And that's when we have to do something about it. <clears throat> we have seven waters on the impaired waters list in this basin, which really is not too bad considering the size of the basin. Um, so the, the yellow on this map, which you can see there's not much of, are impaired waters. So those are um, in Hartford, the old uh, landfill, the closed landfill in Hartford um, has leachate or runoff coming out of that. That's um, impairing that brook. Commissary Brook way at the other end of the, the basin uh, is a small brook that was actually mined for the clay to close the Rockingham landfill. And that caused all sorts of problems. So that one's impaired. Um, and then another form of impairment is what we call altered. Um, it's not like a chemical impairment or anything. Uh, Mill, Mill Pond or Kennedy's Pond in Windsor for um, Eurasian milfoil. 
And the Connecticut River kind of all over the place is, is altered for flow because of the, the hydroelectric dams all along the Connecticut River. Um, again, they, those are all over the place. <laughs> and there is actually a, a impairment or an alteration of the Connecticut River. It's just a bad time of day. <laughs> I keep getting these streaks across my face. Um, for milfoil at like Hoyt's Landing and Harrods Cove, there's, there's milfoil there. Lulls Brook and Millbrook are have are stressed. So they haven't crossed that B2 to impaired line, but they're getting close. So we want to make sure we look at those brooks, we make some changes um, to address sediment and stormwater runoff on, on Millbrook and Lulls Brook. Um, and then on the upper end of Millbrook, Millbrook got hammered by tropical storm Irene. Um, so there's a, there's a number of sediment bank failures and stuff that have put that brook, the upper part of the brook on the list as well. So what do we do about those things? What we try to do and what I'm here to learn about is where, where we need to do things. Where are those locations where you're concerned about the water quality or the habitat? Um, some of the ways we address those are all these different types of projects. We do bu riparian buffer plantings to make sure there's vegetation along the rivers and streams and lake shores to shade the water, to add that habitat, to make sure our rivers aren't heating up in, in July and in this kind of weather so that the fish can't handle it. Stream bank stability projects, road bridge culvert projects, which I'm sure you've seen erode many times, um, agricultural best management practices on farms, stormwater in developed areas. You know, all of these are practices or projects that we can be doing to address what we find out on the landscape. Th this picture is one, one of these is this, this is on the Ottaquichi River where there was an old bridge with the, the abutments were still standing and those abutments constrict the river going it. So it backs up the water that can't get through and then it flies out once it's through. Um, it caused all kinds of erosion and damage. So we went in there, took those bridge abutments down, um, reestablished vegetation so that now the river can come up flood the banks like it's supposed to. Um, other projects we've done and, and Chris was in charge of this one in Springfield, where at the transfer station, we put in a, a stormwater runoff treatment, underground treatment center or system, because um, all the water from the parking lot was draining into one culvert and right out into the Black River. Um, so this underground treatment now captures all those that sediment, um, lets keeps it on the land before it, so it doesn't discharge into the river. Um, this one is, is on one of the tributaries in Weathersfield where an old failed dam was collapsing and there was a culvert just below it that had no ability for fish to go through, I'm trying to move myself around. Um, so the Connecticut River Conservancy and U.S. Fish and Wildlife got together and we took out that dam and made it free flowing and then went to the culvert, replaced that undersized eroding culvert with a nice bridge um, to make sure that there's sediment transport and movement as well as, as aquatic organism passions going through there. Um, and another one that, that CRC did that just planted buffers all along these properties in Heartland. Um, to provide that habitat and shading and bank stability. So all these are different types of projects that we put in place. When we look at these, we look at them by what we call land use sector. This is a list, the agricultural projects that were in our the previous basin plan. And what I'm looking for, we've done some of these, we haven't done all of them. <clears throat> Some of them are in ongoing all the time, like outreach to farmers and things like that. So I'll update this table, bring in new projects and try to find partners to participate in making those projects happen. 
We, as I said, we do it by land use sector, which are agriculture, developed lands, roads, wastewater, and are all the natural resource projects that we do. So we're looking to identify projects and what's out there, what do we want to do, what can we do, um, who, who can we work with, what are the partners. The one thing we absolutely have to have is cooperating landowners, because most of these are on private property. We are not, this is not a mandate. We can't go to anybody and say, you have to do this unless you, you've got a stormwater permit that you're not taking care of. Um, all, all of these on private property are done with willing landowners who are interested in, in improving water quality and habitat. So we're always looking for, for people who want to work with us. And then we look for that funding. How do we fund that project and get it designed and implemented? We have a database of all the projects we've identified so far, and this is just the very first piece of it. You, this is also available online. It's called the Watershed Projects Database, and you can Google that too. It'll bring up 576 projects that are already in the database. 50 of them we've completed since this database was created. And there's either 50 all done or in progress of being done, which means there's only 200, 526 left to go. So we got a bit of work to do, but they are in all these different categories. All these different project types are out there to be done. And again, what we need are those willing landowners who, who can look at this and say, I'm willing to do a buffer along my stream bank and make these projects happen. And you can see where they are in yet another database, which is called the Clean Water Project Explorer, where you, again, you put in the, the basin whoop, that you're looking at, the, the black and Ottaquichi, and it's gonna bring up this interactive map. So you can, some of them are like stormwater projects, natural resources projects, ag projects, wastewater projects, and if you click on any of these buttons, it's going to tell you exactly what that project is. And you can zoom in. If, if you know your house is somewhere in here, you can zoom in and see if that's on your property. <clears throat> and any of the partners that are on here, um, the Regional Planning Commission, Black River Action Team, the Conservation Districts, the Conservation Commissions for our towns, um, all pretty much know this is going on and can put you in touch with, with someone, including me, um, who can help make that project happen. So this is, the, this is how it works. Um, this plan gets developed over 18 months and we're in this, conduct the surveys and hold the kickoff meetings phase for April and May. So that's where we are. And over the summer, I'm gonna be kind of drafting the plan. So I'm, I'm really looking to hear from folks as to what you want me to put in this plan. Um, and then I'll finalize the plan by late summer and, and then come back again in late summer, early fall to see if I got it right. Um, to to show, it, show it to you again and get your comments and see if I missed anything um, and make the final changes on that. So hopefully it will be completed by the end of, of this year. Well, that, that, that's the goal. We'll see how it works. So all of this stuff is available on the Basin 10 website, and you can you can basically just Google Vermont a and R Basin 10 and it will come up. Um, but here's a, our website. And the what I've done this time is created a survey, an online survey for people to give feedback if they can't get to one of these meetings or, um, so there's a survey. And again, if you just Google Vermont a and r Basin 10, it'll come up to the page and it has um, a story map on it to that, that summarizes some of the information that I've just talked about. It's got the survey on it. Um, and it also has two other surveys. Um, both the towns of Windsor and Woodstock are also in the middle of a planning process that's focused on stormwater. So 
the consultant that are, that are leading those efforts have put together surveys focused on stormwater in those two towns. So if, if you're interested or if you know either of those towns really well, um, you are welcome and encouraged to participate in those surveys as well. Um, but there's a, you know, there's a survey for the basin plan and then there's these two surveys as well. And we're always looking for local knowledge because you know, we, we can't be everywhere. We can't know every stream um, and what's going on. So we really rely on input from you folks to, to let us know where we need to focus. Um, and you can absolutely just contact me directly marie.caduto at vermont.gov. I know, I love this picture. This was at, uh, if you know, between Rescue and Pauline Reservoir, Red Bridge Road, someone was about to um, propose to his girlfriend. And this thing is probably about 40 feet wide. They went down into the dam and built this, which I thought was just too fun. So it was... <laughs> And no stream alteration permit needed for that. <laughs> and you know, it's all gone by now. So it's just, it was just really fun. Um, so that's really it. So basically, I'm, I'll, unless somebody wants to see a particular slide again, I'll stop sharing and we can just have a conversation. So, I, I'm looking for your questions and comments and anything else you might want to add. Uh -oh. <laughs> Going twice. Anybody? Oh, Mar Marie, did you get the email that I forwarded you with a handful of um, really good questions that Glenn had? I, I have not to... seen it yet. I took a break before coming on. So if you want, do you want to just tell us what that says? I can. I'm muted. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, obviously some of these probably won't apply at all, but you know, I just kind of figured I'd empty my mind. <clears throat> so, um, what what do we know or what do we want to know about Jewel Brook? It's a pretty big Black River River tributary, and it's impounded by the Army Corps of Engineer dams, which allegedly or apparently during Tropical Storm Irene um, almost failed, or at least the topmost one had some issues. Yeah. So, what do we know about that, and what are we gonna what do we want to find out about that? So Jewel Brook is actually monitoring wise for bugs and fish. It's actually in pretty good shape, um, which is really nice. So uh, the only concern I have is, is where the, the, the town landfill was and transfer station is. There's actually, if just below where the transfer station is, is a wetland and mm -hmm. all the old leachate from um, from the closed landfill is down in there. So it's a wetland that looks the color of your leave button right now. It's just bright red. It's, it's kind of a mess. Um, so that is one discharge into Jewel Brook that I have some concerns about. Um, I don't think that that trib has been monitored in a few years. So it's a good point that I can, Kelly, if you can make that note. <laughs> put the put the landfill trip um, up for updating the monitoring on that. Um, as far as the the flood control dam, so all those little dams are are for flood control. Big dams. Big dams. Yes, <laughs> this is true. They aren't small, um, and they have reached their you know their lifespan pretty much. So they've been about I guess they're about fifty years old now. And NRCS are the ones who, who worked with the town to build those dams. So now that they have reached their, their end of life of dam stability, they're back. And they're working with the town to do, the, do those dams over again. Because the, the dams evidently, I, I'm not that familiar with their flood control 
you know, water level changes. If you're local, you probably see that, but I can't say I have, um, but they are used for and effective in controlling flooding in the village of Ludlow. So those dams are going through a process now of they're, be, they're under design um, to be replaced. So, which is good. You don't want a dam yeah. like that to fail in the next big flood. Um, so that that's what I know about it and where they are in that process. I'm gonna be quick before you go to Larry Martin. Her away. I think I pronounced that right. <clears throat> flood control dams are designed to work empty. Water supply reservoirs are designed to operate full. And there's a distinction, operate empty, operate full, that's um, fundamental to the issues that you might ask about those kind of dams, about dams in general. Did you have anything else on in your email? Yeah. Uh, oh, can I pop hey, in? Number two. Sure, go ahead. Kevin. So it's a DM question again. Okay, well, let's stick with the DM questions and get through those, and then we'll and, go back and forth. And Kelly did get back, to, you know, uh, Kelly got back to me about the uh, Lake Amherst Dam, which is, you know, falling apart. And I guess that's being investigated. Uh, hopefully, uh, there could be expeditious repairs because, because again, anyone who's downstream of any right. of these dams is, you know, in danger. Um, so I'll skip that one. Um, what about, uh, oh, here, uh, projected floodplain mitigations slash expansions on the Black River above the Cavendish Dam and below Reservoir Pond, also known as Lake Pauline. Is there anything going on there? Is that something that this group would consider or this basin plan, you know, is aware of or, you know, so do something? Above the Cavendish Dam, can you describe what you're thinking? Uh, yeah, everything above the dam and below uh, Lake Pauline. So essentially <laughs> everything from, you know, uh, let's say Proctorsville to downtown Ludlow. Okay. Uh, we have, I'm going to see if I can go back to... You know what? Where my property is located. Aha. <laughs> Always of interest. Um, probably the we have a number of projects that are through there. We get most of the projects that are in these databases from um, what are called stream geomorphic assessments. And we've done that on the on most of the black. Um, and we have also done these basin plans, which come out of it, we've done some stormwater master plans, we've done for Ludlow, um, Chris, other, we've just done Ludlow on the upper black, right? Yep, we, we finished that a year or two ago, yep. Okay, so um, pulling up that pro watershed projects database, and I'm gonna share my screen again. Thank you. So we're looking through here. So these are all projects. So so this is Pauline here. I don't think we're seeing your screen. Yeah, oh, Marie, okay. got, got to well, share. I got to share the second time. Sorry about that. There it is. Got it. So you can see that a lot of these are developed land projects. <laughs> um, and, and my, this is mostly what the projects we have identified through that stormwater master plan. So if you come in here, um, as I said, you know, you can zoom in to Ludlow and pop on to one of these. And it's going to tell you that on High Street, the, the potential fix for the runoff there is a a subsurface infiltration system, something similar, pr probably on a much smaller scale um, than we did that we did in this at the Springfield transfer station, that kind of a project. Um, so, so you can see we're then here's one of the, the Jewel Brook dams. Um, so you can see that even there we have some projects that could help address stormwater um, runoff. 
So, because people do use these light, these ponds for recreation. So we want those to stay in good shape as well. So is there anywhere in particular through here? No, I think it's just a general question of whether anything can be done, whether, I mean, I guess a floodway is a floodway no matter what. And so any kind of, uh, you know, um, mitigation efforts within that area is probably not going to make a big difference uh, when we have the 100 year or the 125 year storm. Well, things like this. So in this particular location where there's a, a green dot, um, this is a, a floodplain restoration project, right? So uh -huh. what happened post Irene and actually post the 73 floods and earlier floods is that big heavy equipment got in the river and reamed everything out of it and piled it up on the sides. So you, these big berms were built along the river channel. And while that seems like a good idea because it, you know, the water flows through it, it holds everything right in there. And the water that's supposed to get up on the floodplain all through here can't. Right. And the idea of floodplain restoration is to make that area of land accessible to water again. Because when the water comes out and spreads out, it slows down, it drops the sediment, and it lessens the impact downstream. So even when we do smaller projects that are floodplain restorations, if we do enough of them all along the stream channel, they're like little pressure relief valves all through the system. And that's what we wanna do. So all of these little projects, even though they're, they don't cover a huge amount of land, they all add up to what could make a pretty big difference. So those buffer plantings that hold the stream banks in place and allow the water to flow out instead of those hard berms or hard armoring really do make a difference. Thank you. Um, more questions. Um, how about um, what plans have been formulated to track the expansion of lakeside short-term rentals like Airbnb and their associated impact on water quality, erosion, invasives, et cetera? That, uh, you, that is an area that we don't get into. We're looking at the water quality, so I understand the connection. Um, what we do do on lake shores, and, and Kelly Stetner is, is one of the folks who, who work with this, so we, the, we have a program that's called LakeWise, and it works with landowners of, of all properties, mm -hmm. rentals or not, um, to, to improve their shorelands and make them so that they are not, they don't erode, they have buffers, there's the stormwater runoff from the property is not accessing the lake. So we have those kind of programs that to help landowners make those improvements or to understand how to make those improvements. So that, that's one way we address that particular issue on, on um, I won't, won't call it a resort area, but lakeshore properties that often you know, are seasonal. Sure. Okay, there's one more question and I appreciate your um, <laughs> patience. Um, talked about money, money brook, um, you know, the silting after Irene in the uh, Echo Lake and the other Black River Lakes was significant. And I think it was attributed to money brook. Um, I actually hiked up there one time. Wow, that's pretty rough up there. What, uh, what are the thoughts? Uh, you know, I guess it's like many millions of dollars to try to do something or yeah, it is. Um, it's, it's one of those crazy challenges. If you've seen it, you know, if Money Brook, for those who don't know, is north of the lakes. Um, it's a small tributary that comes in from the west and it, it, scary. <laughs> that was a scary walk up there afterwards. I'll get to you in a second, Todd. Um, so, things let go up there the brook was totally hammered and covered route 100 with massive rubble um so what we have done there um, number one we had it we've had it assessed by a number of different scientists um there was early on 
an effort to try to revegetate those massive failed slopes just at the bottom to try to get some shrubs to start catching and getting roots. I honestly have not hiked back up there in a long time now, so I don't know what the condition of that is. What we're doing now is, so where it comes down and it crosses under 100, the Pingree Flats, that field is now under conservation. So we have a, a river corridor easement on that parcel, except right where the built barns are. Um, the brook itself, the berms have been removed so that the water now accesses that floodplain. So it is already dumping sediment, maintaining that sediment on the land. The wetland is being naturally restored now that the water is back on it. So there's a lot of vegetation through there. We're actually doing a workshop in July. We're gonna visit that with participants and talk about what else might be done to estab better establish that wetland. So it will work as a real wetland, filter water, filter, out, filter the nutrients and um, trap that sediment before it reaches the black. So, you know, that, that's what's been going on. It is a very difficult site. Um, and there, there's just, there's no way to get up in there to address those mass failures. And they're too big to address anyway. Um, so we're doing what we can at the bottom to keep the sediment on the land. Todd, do you want to add to that? Thank you, yes. First off, nobody go up there. <laughs> It's extremely dangerous. It is. Each time somebody has fallen, and I fell once. Ooh. This is a 1.1 Money Brook. I'm sorry. Let me be clear what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Money Brook above the Route 100 culvert. 1.1 square mile watershed. There's been a lot of um, evaluation assessment. And it ain't going to be fixed because there is no fix. This is a 22% stream drain coming down out of the Colorado School of Mines five years ago, maybe more than that. There was a study that came out and we already uh, V transfer concluded that all right, we got to dredge the bridge. That's the cheapest, um, best societal uh, outcome. Hmm. That type of a stream channel, 22% or steeper, has its own set of hydraulics, hydrology, landscape, um, earth type scenarios. So there are these big dis deposits, and then it goes really steep, and another big deposit, and then really steep. When I first got up there, I'm like, I was up there with George Springston, a geologist from the Norwich University. And he says to me, what am I looking at? They couldn't have gotten up here that far with machines. I said, no, they were way down below. So in the next Irene event, those deposits stepped down, they fail and they move. Mm. All the sediment that's stored in these different deposits that goes downstream. And that's one aspect of it, upstream. And then downstream is an alluvial fan. And that's the most unstable river condition that we have. Plymouth has two of them. And pick a, pick a town. You got alluvial fans everywhere. Mm -hmm. People think, oh my gosh, this drain's really good. I can get a septic system here. I can build a house. And Pingree Flats has one, two, three, four, Five, I think, no more, on that alluvial fan, homes that are built there. And we offered to these people, take the HMGP buyout. And they all said, oh no, this is a great place to live. <laughs> so I can go on about flood amnesia. <sighs> okay, um, just a quick follow-up with what Maria said. Um, so Pingree Flats has uh, 
been uh, is now under a conservation easement. Is the landowner compensated for that? What does the landowner get out of that? So, um, river corridor easements is what we call these, and it's like any other land trust purchase of development rights. The landowner still owns the land and can do and can work on it. What the river corridor easement does is what what the agency purchases is what we call the corridor management rights. So what that means is, especially through some place like that where it's flat, the river's always gonna be moving around the landscape. Now it's coming off and it's channeling through the new wetland. What, the, what we purchase from the landowner is their right to manage the channel. So they can't develop near it and they need to keep a 50 foot buffer along the water. Mm -hmm. And that 50 foot buffer moves with the river. So you can't just take a river and say 50 mm -hmm. feet out. And if the river moves 50 feet in that direction, the buffer moves 50 feet over as well. So they cannot manage the channel. They can't put riprap in. They can't, you know, build that berm if they don't like the water coming up on their land. Those are the things that a river corridor easement purchases from the landowner. So they get payment for that. Mm -hmm. It's like any other land trust payment. They get paid for giving up the right to manage that channel. And the, the river, the Vermont River Conservancy is the partner we work with, the land trust we work with most on those. So they hold the easement which is backed by yes. the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, uh, I'm 50 feet from the moving target of a river. Uh, so if they built a, a structure 75 feet and now the river moved and now that structure is within 50 feet, what what happens there? What, I don't quite understand that. I'm Hey, I'm, you know where I'm going with this. I mean, if FEMA doesn't buy out my property and demolish the timber in, uh, is there some sort of uh, thing I can do with, uh, you know, with um, corridor management? There, there may well be. Um, and I'd be glad to do a site visit and come out and take a look at it and bring the right folks with me to talk about that. Thank you. I'm happy to come out too also. <laughs> you guys have been here. All right. Thank you. So Kelly, I'm going to let you call on people because you know who's had their hand up and stuff. Um, I think the only one that I'm aware of right now, at least, is Lori had a question um, back on the map where you were showing, excuse me, uh, impaired waters, stressed waters. Uh, you had uh, three that are right close to Okemo Mountain. One was obviously Okemo Brook, uh, and then another was Coleman Brook. Yeah. And she was asking what the what the impact is that do, do we know have we isolated what the impact or concern is with coleman brook oh let me see coleman brook is is definitely stormwater um impacted it's not stormwater impaired um but i can show you i'll share my screen one more time this is the data that i was just talking about that you can find online That's one of the can you see it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the bug data. Um, so we've been monitoring, or this is displaying monitoring since 1998. The last one looks like it was 2016. And you can see that this is all yellow, red, very little green on this chart. Um, so what this is saying that, that the aquatic biota and the aquatic habitat in that brook are definitely impacted. Um, and, and the issue there, um, you can hit more information and, and it will come up as well. Um, so all these turbidity, which is the cloudiness of the water has been getting worse over time. It gets more and more cloudy. Um, chloride is actually not horribly high, but pretty high, that's road salt runoff. Um, so some of these things, conductivity is, is also a reflection of like salts in the water and particles in the water. So that's sort of increasing basically, it's up and down. Um, so all these different, different conditions are telling us that, that this brick is being impacted. And if we, if we go deep, dig deeper into the data, 
um, it does identify stormwater and land development as the issue that's impacting that brook. And just for the record, um, BRAF does have a volunteer who is taking field data from Coleman Brook, among others. Um, and I'm keeping track of that in an Excel spreadsheet. It's actually right now a Google sheet so that I can more easily share it. Um, so I would be very happy to share that. Marie has access to it. I think you hopefully will use that to sort of pre-screen sites that the state needs to take a much deeper look at or wants to take a deeper look at, flag it for a bug, a bug assessment. Uh, but Lori, if, if you're interested, I'd be happy to share that link with you if you just want to look at it. Kelly, do you want to go through some of the questions in the chat, if there are any? Um, I will scroll back through. I know Todd mentioned a training in Weathersfield in October of this year. And I, I asked what the training was for, and I think he was waiting to answer that until Lori's question was addressed. So if Todd wants to describe his tra the training opportunity, that would be great. Yeah, I wanted Lori to get her chance. So. <clears throat> We have a rivers and roads training program mandated by the legislature after I read started in 2012 had by now well this month we'll have over 600 people been through Chris you went through it what'd you think was it okay it was they're very good trainings yep okay so this is open to everybody it's free you don't have to attend both days we start off with PowerPoint slide presentations. And then if you've never seen a river flume table, <laughs> wicked cool. We have in the morning, a flume table presentation. Then we go out in the afternoon, both days, same format. We look at rivers. If you've never seen electric survey fishing, it doesn't hurt the fish. And it's really amazing. And then we go back into the classroom, do another flume table exercise. And it's the same format both days. We're looking at undisturbed reaches the first day. Second day, okay, this project went well, this project didn't go well. So it's likely gonna be at the fire department, um, unless, because I know the town hall is not gonna be big enough. And it's free. I had two people that I see in, in grocery stores, gas stations, you know, they were close to retirement. So what did you think of the Rivers and Roads training? Just two. Well, you know, I, there was some of it I didn't agree with. And I'm thinking, so you agreed with most of it? So shot score, success. It's to show us what is good in flood response, what's not good, and water quality and fish habitat, <clears throat> habitat. So um, that notice will be going out and I can send it to you folks. And if you could pass it on to, you know, road crew, conservation commission, select board, anybody. We've had a lot of people, administration, army corps, um, U.S. EPA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife folks have attended, and they're all like, wow. It's been so successful, Massachusetts Department of Transportation is doing it. Federal Highway Administration has taken our model and doing it. Other states. I'm going to shut up. I talk too much. I'm going to send this out to folks. Glenn, go ahead. So that stream table, is that portable? And by the way, you know, my kids are growing up and if you need any more matchbox trucks or bulldozers or anything, <laughs> I'm happy to donate. They are portable and that would be appreciated. And so this is, this is human nature. The adults, they're sitting there at first, they're like, you know, oh my gosh, I don't want to ask a stupid question. And then they get into watching the flume table and then they're like elbows and they're all like, you know, well, check this out. Oh my God, look at this. The culvert's failing over here. We need to put in a bigger bridge. <laughs> you get the conceptual, the hands-on and the field experience 
that makes it all concrete in two days. And it's just been so successful that hopefully um, you can spread the word and we can get more people to attend in Weathersfield. Thanks, Todd. Oh. If you're saying something, uh, you're muted. Sorry. I was just going to add, you know, that I think that's great uh, having a job where you get to play with that stuff. I used to do that all day at the beach growing up. And uh, hey, I'm looking for a new job. I'll hit you up. Thank you. It's great. So any other thoughts or comments? I guess my question would be, where do you want me to focus? Are there things out there that I should be looking at and, and going to see and hearing about? Marie, do you want to hear about um, spots for people who are, are swimming and fishing and just doing some some public access, or um, are Absolutely. people people are not thrilled about <laughs> people don't no. like to give up their favorite fishing holes? But I do. When we look at those uses of our waters. Um, the very basic level of protection that we do are called existing uses. And if a use has been documented on a water body, anytime since, I think it's November 28th, 1975, it is protected as a use. So the more we document those and know and can say that this use is, has, happened in this location, that is one way that we can protect our waters. So knowing where those are really can make a difference. So you can enter that in the survey, um, the online survey. You can send it to me through email. You can send it to Kelly or Chris or Judy all our partners here um, and they can forward it on to me. So I, I welcome your, your information on that. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, one more quick thing. Um, yes, don't forget the bug spray. <laughs> yeah, I definitely will, Glenn. Um, one more quick thing, as people do, as, pe as people want to do, if, they, if they, they're, they're not thrilled about giving up their favorite spot, not only because, hey, this is where I fish, I don't want anybody else over here, but also if it becomes a protected use um, or a documented use with the state, is that like opening Pandora's box, the next thing you know, the state's gonna, you know, put it under easement and limit the access and, you know, you know what I mean? That, that's where a lot of people's heads go too. That limiting access is not what we wanna do. The more people have access to our waters, the more they connect with them, the more they value them. Um, so we, we, we don't purposefully limit access. They, the only way that happens is if a landowner chooses to not allow public access, which they have every right to do. Um, so you know that, that's how those things happen, not, not through the state. Great, I mean, I know that, but it's nice because this is being recorded and I'm gonna be sharing it. I the unspoken elephant in the room for a lot of people, I think, is, well, if I tell the state there's a vernal pool on my land, then I can't, you know, build a, a deck for my, my grill gazebo or something. They're going to be told what they can't do because there's something nice on their property. Now, I'm not going to say that never happens. I mean, if, if there is a class two wetland, um, you know, there's a class two wetland and, and there are regulations that go along with that. So, you know, those, those regulations have to be, they apply to everybody. Um, what, you know, so I can't say, no one will ever say you can't build a deck here um, because if it's in a wetland, it's still in a wetland. Thank you. That's everything I see in the chat. I haven't got been checking email. I don't see anything new there either. Great. Well, I, well, I, I invite everybody to please, you know, check out the survey. 
um, and, and the other two stormwater surveys as well. Any last thoughts or comments from anyone? When you do, when Chris does send out the link to the recording, can we also see links to um, some of the databases that you mentioned that you, you showed us how to get to? Make it I can easy. add those, that's a great idea. Add those to your notes, please. <laughs> Well, Glenn's heading out. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for to Chris and Manascutney Regional Commission for hosting the meeting for us and Kelly for taking notes for me and, and, and making sure I hear everything that's out there. Um, I appreciate your participation and hope you stay involved throughout the rest of the process. Thank you.